these are the stories we share around the dinner table, tell in front of the campfire, and listen to on our porch. This is a place where tales are told and stories are heard. Grab your tea, your cocoa, your wild turkey whiskey, your wine. Welcome to season two of the Storyteller's Porch, where we will be hearing tales of the farm with your host and storyteller, Jill Davis. Welcome to the Storyteller's Porch. This season is so much fun. We are sharing the stories of the farm that I inherited and the stories of the people who existed in that farm and existed in the world and the importance of knowing our family stories. And with that in mind today, I have a really, like, I'm actually teary-eyed. This is not what I was expecting, but I have a very special guest with me today who's going to share some of her memories of the owners of the farm. So she remembers my mom and dad, Tim and Sue Davis, as grandma and grandpa, or Gma and Gpa. And Gracie Jenkins is here with me today. Gracie is a poet, an author. She gave a TEDx speech when she was 17 or 18. She was very young. And she's my daughter, and I'm super proud. But more importantly, I'm looking forward to hearing her stories of Grandma and Grandpa and of the farm. And so, Gracie, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Me too. I love being on the porch. It's one of our favorite places. We've had <laughs> a lot of time telling stories, haven't we, sweetie? Mm-hmm. Which, just saying, sweetie, I have to tell that story. So if you've been listening to me for a while, you know I have four children. And... Because I had four children, I just was calling for them a lot. And there are two ways that I would call for them. The first way was I had a cowbell. And this cowbell, which probably should head back out to the farm at some point, my mom gave it to me. I don't know if you know this story, Gracie. I don't think I do. In one of the episodes, I talk about my dad chasing the cow around the field and grandma just watching him try to kill himself chasing this cow. And the bell that... I have actually came from that cow. Oh, I was 10 years old. I started a bell collection and this bell had been sitting in the laundry my entire life. Now, of course, that was only like 10 years, but it was my entire life. And I asked grandma if I could have it. She said, you bet you can have it. You can give it away. I'd be happy if I never saw that bell again. I didn't know that piece. That was the first time I ever heard the cow story. The bell reminds me of that. We were in a very large house when we lived in Oklahoma, and I would ring the bell for all four of my children to come because I found I would yell for you all, and my my adrenaline levels would go up because I was yelling, and the house was so big you couldn't hear me because it was an older house that had lots of additions and it didn't carry sound very well. So I would ring the bell. So that was one way I would have you come downstairs or come to wherever I was. The other thing I have always done is, what do I call all four of you? Sweetie. Sweetie. (laughs) And everybody comes. And I'm like, not that sweetie, the other sweetie. But I always knew if I just said sweetie, I would avoid the four names and the cat and the dog. You know, my mother used to say all of our names. And you used to do that too. I know. Wendy, you you would go, Mark, Gracie, Jenny, Scout. (laughs) Exactly. And I, and that's what I inherited sweetie from is I just wanted to say one word and get you there. And we got the cowbell and that worked too. So sweetie, what drink are you bringing Gracie, sweetie, to the (laughs) porch? What are you sharing on the porch today? I am sharing a, because I need the caffeine, my favorite, a strawberry pineapple Dutch Bros Rebel, which if you don't have Dutch Bros is a fantastic little coffee shop. And the Rebel is their version of an energy drink. And it is my favorite. And was it made by anybody particular? It was made by somebody particular. My girlfriend works at Dutch Bros. And so I always get lovely, lovely drinks from my lovely, lovely girlfriend. We will share that Dutch Bro drink. I know you always bring me the sugar-free peach rebels when you are in town. Those are my favorite. I love that we have that today. This story today, our story time today, is really about grandma and grandpa and the farm because they're intermingled, right? And I wanted to chat before we talked about my parents a little bit more. What is your earliest memory of the farm? Oh, gosh. Oh, okay. So my earliest memory of the farm was, I have no idea what age I was actually. In my head, I was like maybe seven, maybe eight. That could be entirely wrong. I was young and we... 
I don't even remember why we were out in Kansas, actually, if I'm being honest, but we were out in Kansas for some reason. And I remember specifically more so than the farm, my first conscious real tornado warning happened when we were there and we were in a hotel and I remember sitting in the bathtub. And then the next day we went out to the farm and I remember walking around the back of the barn and just playing back there. I used to play with like all the different dirt and herbs and stuff and make little potions and salves and whatnot. And I remember you and grandpa must have been doing something more boring on the farm. And so I remember walking around there and hanging out in the back and playing with all of the nature elements and being relieved that we had not been swept away by the tornado the day before. And because I had spent several years in Oklahoma, warnings were very normal. That though was the first tornado that I had ever seen the specific kind of damage that I saw. And what happened in that tornado is, and you may not remember this, but we drove over to one of grandpa's friend's house And they have what's called irrigated farmland, meaning they have those great big sprinkler systems that water the lands. And they're made out of cast iron, which is very, very heavy metal. And when we drove up his irrigation sprinkler, and these are very long, like they irrigate an entire quarter section. So they're huge. I don't know how big they are, but they're huge. It looked like a corkscrew because the tornado had picked it up and moved it across fields. I don't remember that part. Probably because like I was so overwhelmed by it. And so then we went out about a year ago. Do you remember that trip? So tell a little bit about the trip to the farm that time. So we went out. I had come to Colorado Springs to visit you from Oklahoma. Then on one of the last days there, we went out to the farm. I stayed a few extra days so we could drive out to the farm to see it. I hadn't seen it since I was really young. And also to clean. You and I have cleaned quite a few houses together, quite a few spaces together. So we've got a good rhythm. So I was ready and we went and brought the speaker and played music and We spent the whole day cleaning the house and they had recently done work on it. I don't remember what they had done, but I remember there was a bunch of dust and stuff that we had to sweep up. And I think they were putting in like the AC unit or the HVAC or something. Yeah, HVAC system. Yeah. And the main, (laughs) the main part that I remember very clearly was cleaning the bathroom, which was (laughs) quite an adventure, but we got it clean. (laughs) It was an adventure. The house had been a little bit in a very gentle way, had been a little neglected. And I think maybe because the tenants were older, I'm not exactly sure. But this past weekend, I completely patched, repaired, and painted that bathroom. It has a new toilet, a new sink, a new floor, and new windows. So in a year, we have taken that farm and turned around. I can't wait for you to come back and see it. Remember when we walked around the farm and we saw, you know, there's so many trees and then the corn and the weed and we saw it all. You made a comment about how you felt out there. Can you tell me a little bit about that? I think for me, going back out was a time where I, going back out to the farm was a time where I really felt connected to family history and not even like history in the traditional like textbook sense, but just in the sense of the way that the land holds memory and held the memory of all of the people that had been there, not even just like our family history, but just all of the stories that had unfolded in that part of the country and on that land. Even just like things like seeing the wheat and the fields was so impactful in feeling like I was a part of the stories that I grew up hearing and hearing stories about the farm from my grandpa, especially about that world, actually getting to be in the same place, seeing the same things that I know he saw and that my great grandfathers saw and all of that felt very much like I was connected to it and not just witnessing it. And it was just a reminder too that there are little pockets of home everywhere. That home is not just one place because it felt a little bit like home, even though I had never lived there and had only visited once before, feeling that connected to all of the people that had been there before and had contributed to it made it feel a bit like home. I really do believe that in our collective memory, there is the collective memory of being agriculture 
people mm-hmm. of the land. Mm-hmm. I believe there's a collective memory of that, of just knowing where our food comes from. One of the things I found interesting that happens over and over again when we tell these stories of the farm, because it is a very, and you and I are both feminists, and it's a very patriarchal system. And I always talk about great granddad and my dad and my great grandfather. And we miss the whole point of the whole reason this farm came down to us is because my grandma Mm -hmm. inherited it from her father. We forget that. And we forget the lineage of that. This last week when I was out there, Gracie, I walked around where the current house sits. And Mm -hmm. that is where my grandmother had her garden when she was a child. And she always said she would rather be in the dirt than in the house. It's so fascinating. And then I watch you and I watch you with how much you love plants and gardening and growing things, which I don't. (laughs) That is in our genetics too, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I just love that. Today, Gracie, the main reason you and I talked about doing this Storyteller's Porch was to share your stories, but also because a farm is, it just is so entwined with my mom and dad, your grandma and grandpa. And I wanted to give a really personal glimpse into both of their lives from something that you and I have written at different times. Storyteller's Porch didn't exist in its current rendition as a podcast. We've always told stories on the porch, but this is as a podcast. And what we're going to read today, I'm going to actually read the eulogy that I wrote for my mother. At my mom's service, it wasn't convenient for me to do any kind of a presentation. So I just sat down and wrote something about her and wrote everything that I could think of at that time about who my mom was. I'm going to read this story that I wrote. And I wrote this in January of 2015. And this is now in March of 2022. And even in the seven years since my mom passed, I realized how much of my mom I missed because I was never an adult with my mom as an adult. She was always my mother. And you and I talk about that, no matter how good of friends we are, I will always be your mother. There will always be that little bit of difference there. And because she was always my mother, I didn't always see her fully as a person. And so these are my memories of her. And I wish I had asked more questions. So listeners, this is your reminder. Ask more questions. Don't wait till you wish you had asked more questions. A daughter's reflection of a mom's love. When I do sales training, I tell a story of my mom that reflects how she truly brought the gift of entertainment and joy to the world. And she brought it in bushels. Over the last few days, I have been hearing story after story that I have never heard before. And I realized that since I spent most of my adult life away from Colorado Springs, I missed many of these stories. And then I also realized that for the same reason, not many of you know my stories of my mom as they happened with just she and I in other places. To me, my mom was the world's greatest adventure. When I was so young, I don't even know how old I was. My mom took piano lessons. When I was in elementary school, she took up bowling and then golf and then tennis. When I was 14, my mom and I took ballet lessons together. And after I left home, my mom even took up belly dancing for a bit with my other sister. My mom loved adventure. Her Johnny Weissmuller Tarzan call was the epitome of her love of adventure. And if you ever heard her give it, you're probably hearing her in your head right now. No one could do it like mom. And she called us in from play with that Tarzan call. For me, however, adventure is something I only do through sheer force of will. I love safety and security, peace and calm. And my mother knew that. I left home at 17 for marriage and children and did not spend much of my daily life with my mom for many years. However, whenever I came to visit, I would walk into my mom's house and feel the safety of home. I would sit down on the couch and feel the sunshine streaming through the front window. And within a few minutes, I would be nodding off and then a blanket would be laid over me with a mother's kiss to my forehead as my mom would say, just rest now. And then I would rest soundly in the safety of my mom's love. When I woke up, she would be playing with my children. I felt surrounded by her love and grace. My mother gave me a place in life to rest and recover so full of the love only she could give. She met me where I was. With the birth of each of my children, my mother showered me with gifts, gifts just for me, not for the babies. She always said the moms get lost in the shuffle and the babies don't know the difference. So she took care of me, the mom. Lipstick, nail polish, cookies, clothes, haircuts, pedicures, all comfort gifts intended just for me 
and simply given to provide joy. While raising four children and moving many times, money was often a bit tight. And I cannot tell you how many times I would get a check in the mail with a note from my mom telling me to treat myself to something special. And she would find out if I spent the money on bills or on the kids. The gift was just for me, and she couldn't wait to hear what I had spent it on. My mom was the best at reminding me that this too shall pass. And there's always something fun to do while it's passing. My children have so many sweet memories about Gma. My oldest two children were able to spend a lot of time with her when we lived here for a few years during their elementary years. My mom would often pick them up from school and take them home. They remember how she used to sneak them sugar cubes that were for the horses. But my mom loved showering them with love and the treat of being just a bit naughty, but not too much. My younger two remember her in her later years. They remember with laughter how she would play the Wiggles game with them and throw herself into being the pirate with a peg leg, doing the perfect pirate arg as she walked across the kitchen floor. My mom knew how to make someone feel loved and gave me the beautiful gift of a safe place to land over and over, especially when my adult life became shaky and then when life truly fell apart and I hit the bottom. She was there even as everything else familiar disappeared. She was there to help me pull it all back together again and to remind me that fun, adventure, and safety were all still available to me. As the youngest child of many, it is easy to get lost in the shuffle. My Gracie knows this. It's the blessing and the curse of being the baby of the family. I experienced it on a few occasions, but my mom would laugh and give me a hug, say a prayer and a blessing over me, and I would feel her love. And being the youngest felt like the very best thing in the world. Each day before we went to school, my mom would stand with us three girls at the front door and send us to schools with prayer and love. I know that as a mother, she sent me into the world with the same prayers and love I felt throughout my entire life. I have always known my mom loved me deeply. She used to say, I can't love each of you the same because you are so different and special in your own way, but I love you each with my whole heart. Mom, I will always and forever hold that love in my heart, and I will always love you with my whole heart too. Enjoy your tennis game with the angels and dance on the rock but with our babies. Goodness, I didn't expect to get teared up. Enjoy your tennis game with the angels and dance on the rocks with our babies. We will see you again. I love you, Mom. And that's the story of my mom and who she was. I've heard that a few times, but each time I hear it, it just, it is a really, really good summary of her essence, I think. She's pretty cool. Yeah, she was. She's pretty badass. <laughs> she was so badass, and I had no idea how badass she was. Yeah. So I look back and I think her whole life was badassery. And I like, didn't see it close enough. Um, but as I look back, I certainly see it. The next thing I have to read is something that I found that you've never heard. It's a letter I wrote to my dad on his 91st birthday, two weeks before he was told that he had six weeks left to live. So I wanted to read that, and then you have something special to share as well. So here's how it starts. Dear Daddy, happy 91st birthday. I don't think you ever liked birthdays. I know as far back as I can remember you didn't. I remember when I turned 30 and you called and wished me happy birthday, and then commented on how old I was and how old that made you. Well, somehow, Daddy, we made it to 91 and 55. I wanted this birthday letter to tell you how much I love you and how grateful I am for all you and mom have given to me and my family. I could not have made it through without you. I have so many memories around the good things in our lives, but mostly just that you were always there for me. It's been really hard sometimes since the divorce. I never planned or wanted to be a single mom with four kids to raise on my own. And yet you and mom were both there for me financially and emotionally. I remember distinctly one morning when I was crying to you about how hard it was and I didn't know what to do. That was in the early days. And you told me you would always be there for me. And you have been. I hate to think about what would have happened if you hadn't helped me with the lawyer freeze when my ex wanted to have full custody of the kids. I doubt he would have gotten them, but I would have probably lost my mind with worry. Having you there to listen and encourage me and pay for it made all the difference. I remember the years before you and mom moved to Arizona and I would come over and have coffee in the mornings or in the hours before I went to pick the kids up from school. Those are some of the most peaceful times in my memory. No matter how lost or confused I felt, I knew I could feel peace at the house. My older two often say that they are recognized at work for their strong work ethic. And they always say they learned it from their grandpa Davis and not just how to work hard, but how to get the job done right. 
And they are so grateful for those lessons, Daddy. When the two little ones were small, mom was such a big part of their lives. For them, grandma was all about fun and laughter. I spent so much time worrying and trying to survive. I didn't model having fun for them, but they learned it well from grandma. 91 years is a long time to be here, and I know how much you must miss mom. I miss her too, but I'm glad you are celebrating another birthday. The world is such a better place because of you and because of you and mom. I remember when you came to stay with me for a week after you moved to Arizona. I had so much fun sitting with you at lunch and hearing all the stories from your friends of how you and your friendship impacted their lives. I love you so much, Daddy. I am grateful every day for who you are. Thank you. So we were telling stories long before the storyteller's porch. And I sometimes take a little credit for your love of stories and the written word because you were raised with it. I really was from as early as I can remember. Would you be willing in the few minutes we have left here on the porch today to do two things? One is tell our listeners the story of you learning how to be a public speaker. Yes, I would love to. Okay. And then the second thing is you have a poem that I would like you to read today. So which would you like to do first? I will give you choices. We'll start with the public speaking story. I was just telling the story the other day. It's one of my favorites. I have been very lucky to grow up without ever having a fear of public speaking. Um, I obviously get nervous like everyone does, but my earliest memories include learning how to public speak. So I don't think I really had time to even like consider (laughs) developing a fear of public speaking. (laughs) My first like real presentation of pre-prepared material and I had like a slideshow and all of that was in third grade. And in my elementary school every year, you had like a special topic and you had to do like a bunch of different projects on it. Second grade was space things and third grade was animals and fourth grade was states and you got one assigned. And so third grade, I had to give a full presentation about polar bears. And I felt pretty good about it, but definitely was more nervous just because I hadn't done anything about like that before. And we ended up with the good fortune of getting a snowstorm the night before my presentation. So we had a two-hour delay the next morning. With that extra two hours, I wanted to practice my presentation. With the time, not only did I practice the presentation, but because my mom was a speaker coach, I got a full public speaking lesson. And so we went up and we got all of my stuffed animals from upstairs, which was quite a lot. Brought all of the stuffed animals downstairs, lined them all up on chairs like an audience. And then I got out my flashcards and I learned how to public speak. And my mom, who is here, taught me how to take a few steps and pause and then deliver and to make eye contact with each of my stuffed animals at one point during my speech. That way they felt connected with and how to take a deep breath before I changed the slide and flipped my flashcard. I've built on those skills, but most of my like core skills, foundational skills come from that lesson. That's such a fun story. Every time you tell it, it makes me giggle because I just remember setting up all the animals and I'm thinking, okay, we got to make sure they have their eyes looking at her. So we got to have animals <laughs> with eyes on them. And it was such a fun thing. It and was. it took you to where you gave a TEDx speech and we'll include that in the show notes. It is on a sensitive topic, but it is a great, great TEDx. And I'm delighted that you were able to do that in, when you were in, still in high school. Yeah, it was pretty cool. And then Gracie, Tell me about the poem that you're going to read. Yes. Okay. So I have been a poet for longer than I think I've even been a speaker. And that is really my first love. And one of the ways that I really process relationships and connections and conceptualize them is through poetry. And Although I didn't know her for as long as I would have liked to, I was very close with my grandma and I have pretty much nothing but fond memories of her and very close and sweet and soft memories. While I, of course, love my grandpa, he was kind of an elusive figure in my life and he was always there and I loved him, but I didn't really know how to talk to him or how to like, 
engage with him just because he definitely gave off that kind of Kansas farmer, a little bit gruff, a little bit serious, did not do any Wiggles impressions, unlike (laughs) grandma, Um, (laughs) did not try to be a pirate or sneak me sugar cubes. (laughs) So after he passed, I found myself really wanting to sit with him more and sit with his stories more. And I specifically, as my physical anchor, spent a lot of time with one of the few things that he gave to me in his life, which was an old brownie camera. I also am a photographer and I started doing photography when I was super young. And so probably when I was 14 or 15, I was just getting into taking more pictures and he gave me the camera that he had. It's an old brownie camera that he had on his ship in World War II when he served. It is one of my most prized possessions. It comes with me everywhere, no matter how small the move is. And it always sits on my nightstand. And so this poem is entitled In Honor of the Brownie Camera That Sits Proudly on My Nightstand. And will you read that for us, Gracie? Grandpa never claimed to be an artist. Dirt was the only paint you'd ever find stuck under his fingernails. His knuckles were hardened from the wild Kansas winds. His palms cracked open like shifting soil. Grandpa never claimed to be educated. Knew a lot about the best hunting spots on the way to school, though. A ninth grade dropout who had already read all the books in the library and was bored of worlds that only existed within four walls and the 464 pages of the Grapes of Wrath. And Grandpa never claimed to be tender. Preferred to let Grandma clean the boo-boos, wipe the tears, hold the babies on her cocked hip. He met the morning with gruffness and saved smiles for the pastor on Sunday. Instead, Grandpa painted portraits with the promise of provision the all-powerful provider. His bones were meant for hard work and he never took it for granted. He created theater in the fields, cutting and pruning wheat into wonder and sculpted success out of the corn ears in the thrift garden. Instead, Grandpa knew more about the way the world worked than any PhD education could teach. Farmer boy, turned merchant marine, turned miner, turned father, turned flooring business owner, turned grandfather, turned magic maker. He knew how to install floors and dance studios and famous hotels and where to find railroad spikes for make-believe play. And most importantly, Grandpa knew how to cut carpet scraps to fit the floors of my dollhouse And that is the most important thing anyone could know. And when he thought no one was looking, Grandpa would gingerly tie sailor's knots for me and his creaky recliner when all the adults were away, his tone relaxing into remembering. And the blue in his eyes would melt into those of a barely 17-year-old dreamer. Still desperate to have just one drink of freedom. I love that poem so much because in so many ways you've captured my father. And one of the things that our listeners can find in our show notes are links to your book. She wrote like poetry that you published when you were just 14 or 15. 15. 15, or just 15. We'll also have a picture of the brownie camera with a few of the shots that my father took on ship with that brownie camera. It is such a joy just to know that you know the stories and you will continue them on. Clarissa Pinkola Estes, who is one of my absolute favorite storytellers, 
talks about the concept that as long as one person still knows the story, the story will continue. And I was always the story keeper in my family. You are currently a big part of the story keepers in our family. And I'm grateful for that. Is there anything else you'd like to say about grandma and grandpa? I think though we did a pretty, I think we did them well. I think we did do them well. And the thing, the thought, the process, the concept, the feeling I want to leave today from our personal stories that have collective impact is please, please, first of all, tell the people you love now that you love them because you never know when they'll be gone. And number two, ask the questions, listen to the stories, record the stories. They matter and they matter forever. The stories we share here on the porch are personal with collective impact. Here at the Storyteller's Porch, we believe we are the stories we share. Keep living your story and meet us next time here on the porch. And be sure to bring your favorite drink. To learn more about this season's storytellers and to catch past episodes of The Storyteller's Porch, visit us at thestorytellersporch.com. To make sure you hear every exciting episode with Jill this season, subscribe and follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and wherever you hear your favorite shows. We'll see you next time here on the porch at the farm where I'll be drinking iced coffee and occasionally some wild turkey whiskey. What drink will you bring?